So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the PPE now because some things have changed. And I'll try to go uh, you know, a little bit slowly just because I wanna make sure that um, we highlight the differences between what we were doing and what we are going to be doing from now on. Um, so some of this hasn't changed. Certainly a dental healthcare personnel should wear a surgical mask, eye protection such as goggles, protective eyewear with solid side shields, or a full face shield, and certainly prescription glasses that don't have side shields do not comply with this um, recommendation. And a gown or protective clothing that covers from the neck to the knee and to the wrist is worn during procedures likely to generate splashing or spattering of blood or other body fluids. However, additional um, precautions are being recommended if you're going to be performing aerosol generating procedures. And this is whether this is in, including patients who are assumed to be non-contagious. So all of these recommendations that we're going to talk about right now are not for people who may have COVID-19. They've either been confirmed or they're suspected. These are precautions that are for patients who we believe are not contagious. But because many patients will be asymptomatic, the CDC does recommend that you consider the use of an N95 respirator during aerosol generating procedures, or even a respirator that offers a higher level of protection. And that will be things such as other types of disposable filtering face piece respirators, purifying air particulate respirators. Those are the ones where you have a hood over your head and then air is supplied um, you know, from a, um, an external pump or elastomeric respirators. Those are ones that are, are made of um, usually some type of a, a silicone or latex, and then they have canisters that go onto them for filtration. Um, and then respirators should be used in the context of a respiratory protection program, which includes medical evaluations, training and fit testing. And I will talk about that in just a little bit more detail. If a respirator is not available for an aerosol generating procedure, you can use the highest level available FDA cleared surgical mask and a full face shield. And when they talk about levels of surgical face masks, these are designated by ASTM, which is a standards making organization that sets manufacturing standards for many, many, many things, including surgical masks. And there are three levels, one, two, and three. Level two and three have the highest filtration efficacy and level one is slightly less. Where they really differ is down in the um, part of the chart where it says resistance to penetration by synthetic blood. That means it's fluid resistance. And so level one has the least amount of fluid resistance and level three has the highest. So if they're available, it's being recommended that you use level three masks. OSHA has requirements for N95 respirators. And that is that employers must first institute engineering work practice controls before resorting to PPE as a measure to protect workers. And I think we've all done that. In dentistry, there are not a lot of engineering and work practice controls that we can use because the procedures that we do by their very nature involve exposure to patients' blood and body fluids. So we rely on PPE to a great extent in dentistry. Before an employee can use an N95 or other respirator, they must have a qualified healthcare provider review a medical questionnaire, and that can actually be done online. There are a number of services that you can send the questionnaire in, and then they'll have a medical professional review it and let you know whether or not a physical exam is needed. And we're finding about 10% of the time our personnel are needing to have a physical exam, but a lot of our, and this is our faculty, but a lot of our faculty, you know, are older and maybe more prone to having, you know, asthma or other respiratory problems. There has to be a fit test initially and then um, training. And right now, OSHA has included training on COVID-19. OSHA has modified temporarily some of the requirements and notices of these modifications are on the OSHA website. They address things such as um, extended use of N95s and reuse of N95s, as well as um, temporarily suspending enforcement on annual fit testing, which is usually required. The FDA also has issued um, emergency use authorization because of the shortage of N95 respirators. They've provided um, this EUA for certain alternatives that have not been tested and cleared by NIOSH. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health is the agency 
that tests and approves um, respirators and then FDA clears them to go to market and be sold. And this includes some KN95 respirators. And the full list is on the FDA website. And it was last updated on May 27th. Right here, you can see a little a copy of the top of it. Um, and it's going to be, these are going to be allowed for the duration of the public health emergency related to COVID-19 that's been declared by the Department of Health and Human Services. So once the health, once HHS says this is no longer an emergency, then these will no longer be authorized. And again, the temporary enforcement guidance from OSHA is found on the OSHA website. And this is the federal OSHA website. If you're in a state OSHA plan, um, if you're in a state with an OSHA plan of its own, then you want to check your own state OSHA website to see if they have additional requirements or um, if they have rules that are stricter than the federal. Because whichever rule is most strict, either the federal or the state, that's the one that we're supposed to follow. So they talk about um, fit testing for filtering face piece respirators of which an N95 is one. And again, that um, the, the, um, the initial fit test is required, but not the annual fit test. And a fit testing can be done either by the employer or by an outside party. You can purchase fit test kits that come with instructions on how to do the fit test, and it doesn't require any special qualification to do so. And again, um, initially uh, fit test and during times of non-emergency, annually thereafter, these kits use an agent, usually one that either has like a sweet taste or a bitter taste to check whether there's leakage around the respirator. The way that they work is you have the person who's being fit tested put on the respirator and adjust it, put the hood over their head, and then there's like a little nebulizer that the person doing the fit test um, sprays into the hood. If the person can't taste the sweet or the bitter agent, then that means that they have a good seal on their, um, on their respirator. And you know, so it's a pretty simple process, but there are some things that need to be done by such as you know, trying the fit test um, while the person is bending over or while they're turning side to side. It can't just be you know, one quick test and that's it. It takes about 20 minutes. These fit tests are available commercially, although along with the, the shortage of N95 respirators, these have become high demand also. And so, so my experience is that it might take about a month to receive these after they've been ordered. There's a lot of resources that are available for respiratory protection program because you do have to have a written program. Um, one of the resources is OSHA and they have this Hospital Respiratory Protection Program Toolkit. And even though it's geared towards hospitals, there's a template for the required written program in there where you would just have to fill in the blanks and then delete the sections that simply don't apply to you. And then you'd be compliant with the written program. The AAOHN, which is the um, American Association of Occupational Health Nurses, has free online training, both for the respiratory protection program, um, for, the, for the users, which is the required training, and then they have a separate module for the person who's going to be the respiratory protection program administrator, which is also call, um, re, re, um, required by OSHA. And that's at ahohn.org. And this is free because it was developed with funding from the federal government from NIOSH. And then NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has numerous resources about respirators. And I think because this is an area that's really new for us in dentistry, it's, it's, you know, it's up to us to educate ourselves about respirators and make sure that we feel comfortable that we're using them properly and safely. Because right now they're an important part of our PPE. 